So this is a talk about the significance of the Kuiper Belt. <coughs> I have a lot to say. Don't worry too much. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, the summary of the scientific part of this talk is, is really here. So the Kuiper Belt is scientifically significant on many levels. It's a deep freeze for, for volatiles in the solar system. It gives us this big picture view of the solar system and many subcomponents of the solar system that we didn't have before we discovered the Kuiper Belt. Um, it contains a, a very interesting record and a unique record of the evolution of the solar system, something we never thought we'd have, but we now do. Uh, and in fact, it's also a local debris disk analog. And I hope to get to the point where I can tell you what that means. So I would like to begin with this aside, because I think it's important to tell you uh, exactly what we do. Jane started that. I want to do a bit more of that and where we do it. <coughs> and also, I think this is a good way to remind you that when you're doing science, it's important to keep in your head this feeling of being a, a small person on a big planet. So a great place to do that is actually where we take data. This is Mauna Kea in Hawaii. This is a 4,000 meter tall volcano in the middle of the Pacific. As Jane said, it's very high, not much oxygen, not much humidity. It's great for astronomy, not so good for people. Um, but it's a very impressive place to be. So the, the anecdote that I like to relate about Mauna Kea, there, there are many, many of them, um, is that you know, often you can go outside, stand outside the telescope dome in the evening when you're going to start observing. The wind is blowing in your face at 50 miles an hour, and you think, that's nice. So you go out at midnight. It's still blowing from the same direction at 50 miles an hour. Sunrise, 5 or 6 o'clock in the morning, same thing, 50 miles an hour in the face from the same direction. Next night in the evening, 6 p.m., you go back. Wind straight in the face, 50 miles an hour. So this wind is blowing fast for a really long time. So it just immediately tells you the vastness of the Pacific Ocean. And that's just a tiny part of our planet. So if you want to feel small on a big planet, Mauna Kea is the place to be. Here's a movie that shows what you see if you stand outside a telescope. This is a view to the east. Here are volcanoes. This is snow. Here are clouds. This is the sky. It's a bit bright, but you can see stars. There's um, a bright star coming up, uh, rising in the east. Here's a planet, and then the sky begins to brighten as the sun is about to come up. Sun bursts into the sky. Immediately, you can see the boiling clouds, which are below us. So you have the feeling of being in an airplane without walls looking down on the clouds. These clouds are capped by a thermal inversion layer, but they boil up as the ground heats during the day. You think they're going to come over the summit, but in fact, the sun goes through the um, maximum altitude. Then cooling begins, and they shrink back down. Uh, and then suddenly, we see the shadow of the mountain across the surface, and then we see the shadow of the Earth going up over the sky, then it's nighttime again. And then stars begin to come up, and we'll see the moon coming up about here in just a moment. There it goes. And that's it. And it goes on and on and on. So it's really an incredible place to be. <laughs> now, people love, uh, people who make move, uh, documentaries, uh, science documentaries, know about this, of course. And they want to come out, and they want to make good-looking documentaries. And they call you up and they say, hey, Dave, we'd like to come out and take a movie of you observing. And I say, don't bother, because we don't look through the eyepiece. We're typing on computers. We're, it's not that interesting to watch. And they say, yeah, we'd really like to come and do it anyway. And this has happened a number of times. And so I uh, made my own movie uh, showing what it's really like to be an observer. And I'll just show you what that's like. So here it is. This is actually taken at the Keck telescope. Uh, and here we are. So this is. <laughs> There are a set, of, a set of computers around here. This is me. This is Pedro Lucerda, who's over here. He's a postdoc in uh, Belfast at the moment. We're looking at the computers to see that the telescope is pointed correctly, to see that we're focused correctly, to see that everything is working. Usually, it doesn't work uh, very well. And we just keep doing this. This is how thrilling it is to, to film. Uh, we're, we're moving around. It goes on and on. We're taking more and more images, in this case, as we go through the night. Sometimes it's spectra. Uh, <coughs> We're talking about it. Uh, we get hungry sometimes. We go out and look for food. Uh, sometimes we find food, come back with an apple. <laughs> Pedro takes a mysterious dive on the floor. We don't know what that's for. Uh, we continue. It's kind of cold. Uh, as the night goes on, it gets colder and colder, so we put on our coat. Uh, and basically, we carry on messing with the computer because we're really, really interested in data. Okay, So astronomy is a very, very data-driven subject. <laughs> so that's. So that gives you an idea of what it's like to do what we do. OK, so that's out the way. 
So here's the solar system before Kuiper Belt. This is what I call, meaning no offense uh, to any grandmothers, your grandmother's solar system. Uh, this is the old conventional solar system in the sense that the interest was all in the big things, the things that we called planets. Uh, and then the artist who drew this put the small things in this little box that he called other, and this kind of a weird potato-shaped thing there. <laughs> so the irony of the last 25 years uh, in the solar system is that actually this little box called other is really, really interesting and has an enormous amount of information in this throwaway box uh, from an old, kind of an out-of-dated picture. So information content is not closely connected to the mass of the thing. Just because it's big, it doesn't mean it's particularly important scientifically. Um, small things are very important, too. So uh, a very quick overview uh, would be like this. The, the, uh, st the stars form by an instability in the gas in the interstellar medium. They collapse. Ga gas clouds collapse under their own gravity. This is a particularly nice simulation by Matthew Bate from England. And it shows an initially spherical cloud collapsing just under its own gravity. Bright means it's denser than it was. Uh, you can see it's kind of a swirling, filamentary, collapsing cloud. He's going to zoom in. And you can zoom in and see the filaments a little bit better. And as you look closely at these filaments, they continue to grow brighter, which means denser. And then these white dots begin to appear. Those are called stars. Uh, and the stars spit out from particular star formation centers. So there's a cluster of star formation right there. There's another one that's starting over there. It's like fireflies or sparklers bursting uh, in the night. And so you get the idea that the typical instability, called a genes instability, in a collapsing gas cloud gives a cluster of stars. And so we infer that our sun probably was a member of a cluster of stars in the beginning. And in fact, we know that that's the case because we see in the meteorites the decay products of very short-lived radioactive elements like iron-60 and um, aluminum-26 that must have been produced just a million years before the collapse by the explosion of a supernova, which is a massive star. And massive stars are very rare. And the only chance we would ever have to be near a massive star would be in a cluster like this. So the sun was in a cluster, and now we're not. We've escaped from the cluster, but that's the origin of our system. Now, as these little nuggets collapse under gravity, they spin faster and faster and faster for the same reason that a skater spins faster and faster when he or she pulls in the arms. Conservation of angular momentum, that's called. And so an initially spherical blob of gas contracts into a rotating disk. And this is a, a simulation of such a disk. The disk is why the solar system is a planar structure. All the planets go around the sun in pretty much the same plane, all in the same direction, because they all form by accretion in this rotationally flattened disk. And this movie is looking at the formation of a planet. It's a Jupiter-like thing. Uh, it's big enough to open a gap. Uh, and the movie goes all over the disk and shows you interesting uh, bits and pieces of it. But the main thing to get from this movie is that the action occurs in the middle. Not much is happening out there. So planet formation kind of eats a hole in the middle of this rotationally flattened disk. Uh, and out there, nothing much happens. That's where the Kuiper Belt is. So the Kuiper Belt is a place in the protoplanetary disk of the Sun in which not that much happened compared to the inner parts. So we find objects in a state of arrested development. Here is um, uh, an external view of the solar system now. So this is obviously the Kuiper Belt. That's the Sun. These uh, ellipses are the orbits of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And this, uh, this thing here is Pluto. <coughs> the whole inner solar system that we know and love so well and live in is invisible in this diagram. It's so small. So this is a big picture view of what the solar system is like now. And then Jane already showed you that movie. Uh, that's basically our way of finding these objects. We just look for their motion relative to background stars and galaxies. So here's the only technical looking diagram in this talk. This is the distance from the sun, basically, and the orbital eccentricity. Those are circular orbits. These are very elliptical, egg-shaped orbits up there. We've, I've plotted on a subset. We have 1,500 Kuiper Belt objects now, quite a lot. Uh, I've plotted a subset, otherwise it's too messy. And what you really should get from this diagram is the there's not a uniform spread of objects. They seem to occur in different places. Uh, they're pref preferred re regions for Kuiper Belt objects. And I'll say a couple of words about some of these regions. The classicals here have small eccentricities, so their orbits are nearly circular. And they're fairly far from Neptune, which is here, 30 AUs from the Sun. And that means they never get close to Neptune. And that means that they're stable. So the gravity of Neptune is the main destabilizing agent in the Kuiper Belt. If you don't get close to Neptune, you're probably OK on multi-billion year timescales. So they're stable. 
There's a band of objects go up, go, going up there called the scattered Kuiper Belt objects. They are interacting with Neptune only at perihelion. When they're closest to the Sun, they can get a little bit too close to Neptune. Neptune gives them a kick, and that pumps up their eccentricity. And so they go into these looping orbits. They move up here. They, they actually bounce around uh, towards more and more elliptical shapes. And then eventually they leak out of the solar system, and they're gone. And then lastly, there are these blue ones, which miraculously pile up you know, in perfect columns. And again, those are the resonant objects. They are stable because they have a particular dynamical relationship to uh, Neptune, which is over here at 30 AU. And Pluto is that one right there, which you now know because you saw the red X in the previous talk. So I'll just talk about a couple of things, and then um, I'll be done. I would hate to go over time. Um, the inward armada, what's that? Well, it turns out the Kuiper belt beyond Neptune is basically dropping things into the solar system all the time. So you can think of it as kind of rain. There's a rain of debris and stuff coming in. I like to call it the inward armada. Good for Spanish people, perhaps. The inward armadas, <laughs> things are drifting in. So there are various classes of body, which were known in some cases before the Kuiper belt uh, and studied as individually interesting things, but without really knowing any, what's the connection between this and anything else. So we have objects called centaurs. These are not in the Kuiper belt. The Kuiper belt's over here. We have these bodies, which are inside the orbit of Neptune and outside the orbit of Jupiter, which is here. Um, and these things were kind of mysterious. They look, for the most part, like asteroids, but they're not in the asteroid belt. They're not dynamically stable. That means they must have come in from somewhere else, but where did they come from? Nobody knew. So the centaurs, it turns out, are escaped Kuiper belt objects. So we understand immediately where they come from. When centaurs go in closer to the sun, inside the orbit of Jupiter, the ice in them sublimates. And so it makes an atmosphere, and it blows out material. And we look at that thing, and we say, aha, that's a comet. But a comet is actually just a centaur that's drifted too close to the sun. And a centaur is something that escaped from the Kuiper belt. And so the inward armada brings things from here through here to here. And we change the names as they go, but they're all the same thing, really. So we understand the relationships between uh, things in the solar system much better than we previously did. Comets, these are Jupiter family short period comets from the Kuiper belt. We, we know their source. Uh, this is the only nucleus to have been visited by a spacecraft twice in this year and this year. <coughs> uh, this is a Kuiper belt object. And it came out of the Kuiper belt probably a, a million years ago, or a few million years ago, something like that. So now we understand it. We have a context for that. Here's another one. It's a different looking beast. This is an active comet. It's sublimating and blowing out material. Again, it's a Kuiper belt object that escaped and is being heated by the sun to the point where it uh, loses material. Before, we didn't know where the comets came from. And then there's this thing. This is called the zodiacal light. You can see this by naked eye uh, before sunrise or after sunset from a clear sight. It's very uh, prominent. Once you know what you're looking for, it's very easy to see. Uh, I'm sure dogs can see this, actually. I mean, uh, animals from other species could see this. I'm not sure if they can comprehend it. This is light scattered from dust in the inner solar system. And there's al always been this debate. Where does the light come from? Where, where does the dust come from? It turns out it comes from comets, comes from the uh, short period comets, which are themselves the escaped Kuiper belt objects. And so this is a, a cloud of dust. Uh, the rate of dust production is about 50,000 kilograms per second due to the disintegration of comets which are falling in from the Kuiper belt. So the inner solar system, including the Earth, is bathed in dust from disintegrated Kuiper belt objects. And now we know. So Kuiper belt allows us to see the whole system uh, as, a, as a unit. The, the next and almost last thing I'll mention is migration. This is probably the most important result from the Kuiper belt. Uh, these resonant objects are overabundant. If you just threw dots, if you threw stones at this diagram, not many of them would hit perfectly on these lines. So they're overpopulated relative to chance. And why would that be? Well, the only idea that makes um, any sense it, uh, involves migration of the planets. So basically, uh, the idea, and this was pushed a lot uh, and advanced by uh, Reynold Malhotra in uh, Arizona, the idea is that Neptune formed inwards of where it is, and moved out. And as it moves out, its resonant locations, which are places where the orbit period compared to Neptune's period is the ratio of small integers, those resonances sweep through 
the Kuiper Belt beyond. And they kind of sweep up material like pushing a snowplow through the snow. You build up a big wall of snow on the front. Now, resonances are mysterious things. I know that nobody in my classes likes resonances uh, back at uh, UC UCLA. So I have this movie that makes it very clear. A resonance occurs when a force is applied to a system periodically, and the period is the natural period of the system. So if you have a person on a swing, like my daughter Susu sitting on a swing, and you push her in phase with the natural period of the swing, all you have to do is give a little push, and you can build up a big amplitude. Whereas if you don't push in phase with the swing, then you just get messy motion, not so good. And these people going for a walk in the park discovered their own resonances. Uh, they found that this bridge <laughs> can be excited into large amplitude motion by the periodic exertion of a force. So they're, they're basically uh, causing the bridge to go into resonance. And I think the guy at the back is enjoying this altogether too much. I don't quite know what's going on. <laughs> But the point is that they're, they're people are weigh, you know, they weigh a few hundred kilograms in total. They're exciting this big motion in a bridge which weighs many, many, many thousands of kilograms. So a small force periodically applied can have a big dynamical effect. That's the point of this movie. There's a second movie I don't have time to show where they excite a different resonance, a twisting resonance. That's even more bizarre. Um, so in the solar system, what's the natural period? Well, the only period you can think of is the orbit period. And so the resonances in the solar system involve uh, periodic forcing connected to the orbit periods. And that's what we're talking about in the Kuiper Belt. So all of this has been put together in a, a model um, whose conclusions are highly uncertain. Uh, I mean, they're very specific, but their accuracy is, un is uncertain. Uh, but it's very interesting. So this model says, hey, what if um, we can have uh, a solar system in which the planets are moving radially relative to the sun what if those planets themselves drift into a resonance? So we're not talking now about a resonance between a Kuiper Belt object and Neptune. What if two big planets get into a mean motion resonance? For example, Jupiter, which is 300 times the mass of the Earth, and Saturn, which is 100 times the mass of the Earth. What would happen? And so they contrived a model to make that happen, and they look at what would happen. So here's the same kind of diagram, distance from the sun and eccentricity <coughs> of the orbit. And there are four planets. Uh, let's call them uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, for example. And then there's this green thing, which is a band of dots representing a Kuiper belt. So many things have been done to this model. Right? It's artificial, uh, but, but some people believe it represents a possible reality. Uh, these objects have the actual masses of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Their spaces are not the current spaces. Right now, Jupiter is at 5, Saturn is at 10, Uranus is at 20, and Neptune is at 30. So this is a compacted system. And this Kuiper belt, which right now is very low mass, it's only a tenth of an Earth mass. If you add them all together, a tenth of an Earth mass, not much stuff. Uh, in here is 30 Earth masses. So it's been increased by a factor of 300. And there are reasons for doing that. We, we have observational reasons to think that's not uh, a bad idea. What happens? So uh, they simply compute the forces between bodies and see where the particles go. And immediately, they get kicked up. So the outermost planet throws up this arc, which looks like the arc of the scattered Kuiper Belt objects. So these are indeed being scattered by the outermost planet. We have a vertical structure there that looks like it might be a resonance developing. Uh, and then we see these planets are jittering. And they're jittering because every time they throw something away, every time a Kuiper Belt object comes by and gets slingshot accelerated out of the solar system, they have a little recoil motion. Like if I was throwing a sack of coal over there, I would move backwards in recoil. So this goes on. They're jumping around, and this is uh, uh, building up. And you think that it's reached a steady state. Uh, but what is happening is that the planets are also drifting slowly re relative to the sun. And, and so they're, in fact, drifting into this mean motion resonance. And then when they go into the mean motion resonance, we'll see what that does to this model of the solar system, and especially to the Kuiper belt there. So the answer is it, it blows it up. And um, it blows it up if you go back and look at this frame by frame. It blows it up because this planet, which is the one we would now call Neptune, was thrown into the Kuiper belt. And so it strongly disturbs the orbits of all the, the bodies there. And so it's basically cleared out all this stuff. So 30 Earth masses of stuff is shot out, and only a tenth of an Earth mass remains. So it's a nice model. It's a very pretty model. It's a kind of a TV model. We're all trained to watch and appreciate TV. We like that. 
Um, and it, maybe it's correct, but maybe it's not. So it's hard to test this model, but it's a very interesting model. And I would say that I'm presenting it to you now because uh, it's an example of a major impact of uh, the, the Kuiper belt. We must be open to the possibility of models like this, whereas in the past we had this clockwork solar system, everything moves in a circle forever, it's repetitive, it's kind of boring. Now it's really interesting. We don't actually know where the planets were at a given time in the past. Um, when that clearing of the Kuiper belt happened, a shower of debris uh, pervades the solar system. And the claim is that objects can be captured from the Kuiper belt in various places in the solar system where capture is not normally possible. So just as one example, this is a moon of Saturn called Phoebe. Uh, and I include the picture because it's a nice picture. We set a spacecraft by it recently, and it's a nice uh, irregular uh, object with craters and so on. Phoebe is in an orbit which indicates it was captured from somewhere, and one of the places it might have been captured from is Kuiper Belt. So again, this is uh, conceivably a close-up picture of a Kuiper Belt object displaced from the Kuiper Belt and trapped in orbit around Saturn. And there are other populations in the solar system that could be trapped also from the Kuiper Belt. So again, that's this idea of unification of the solar system. There are many, many different populations um, interconnected. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to say is this. Um, we have known for some time that other stars um, are surrounded by dust disks. So here, uh, here is a star. It's been blocked out by um, an opaque disk. But here's a star surrounded by a dust disk, uh, shown in red, by my former student Paul Callas. This dust is special because its lifetime is short compared to the lifetime of the star. That means it's not just leftover dust from when the star formed, it's dust that's been recently produced. Now, how would you make dust around a star? Well, basic idea is you smash two rocks together and you make dust. Well, that's exactly what happens in the Kuiper Belt. And so we believe that there's an unseen Kuiper Belt. Here's a different kind of a picture of the same thing. We think there's a Kuiper Belt in, around this star, just like ours, but more active. It's about a 1,000 times more active uh, than our one. So Kuiper Belt provides unification uh, not just between different populations in the solar system, but between the solar system and other stars as well. So it's a very, very cool thing. So we go back to that summary that I already showed you. Kuiper Belt significance is on many levels. It's a deep freeze. It's very cold. I forgot to mention the temperature is about 40 Kelvin. It's, everything there is frozen forever, essentially. Um, we have this unification of different populations in the solar system. We have this very, very interesting and unexpected record of things that happened in the past, traced in these different subunits of the Kuiper Belt population, the classicals, the scattered, the resonant, and so on, Kuiper Belt bodies. Uh, and then we have our own solar system is now an analog of the debris disks that we see around other stars. So I'm out of time, and I'll finish. Thank you. <laughs>